Our next series test for convergence only applies to a certain type of series, alternating series. So to motivate this a little bit, let's consider the limit test for divergence. Somebody hands me a series, the first thing I should do is check with the limit test. The limit of the sequence a sub n that our series is based on does not go to zero, series automatically diverges, and we could just walk away from it. If the limit of a sub n is equal to zero, the answer is not convergence, the answer is just you need to do more work. So for the alternating series, we're going to be able to do something with the fact that the limit of a sub n goes to zero. So the alternating series test is going to repair this fact somewhat. All right, so definition of an alternating series. We're going to have a sequence a sub n, all of its terms are positive. Then an alternating series is just taking that series for a sub n, but we're just going to alternate signs between plus and minus. So for my first type, we start with a plus, and that's a1 minus a2 plus a3 minus a4. For our second type, we'll start with a minus, so I'll have minus a1 plus a2 minus a3, and so on. And then you notice, well, really these are almost the same type because 2 differs from 1 just by multiplying by a minus 1. So it's going to be enough for us just to consider the case where the very first term is a positive number. Then we can get to case 2 just by pulling a minus sign out of the whole entire thing. Okay, alternating series test. I have my alternating series. Okay, all of our ANs are positive. I only need to check two things to get convergence. I need the limit of the a sub n's as n goes to infinity is equal to zero, and that my a sub n's are decreasing. If I have these two conditions, then my series is going to converge. Okay, example. Let's try. Okay, we're going to take the series from 1 to infinity, minus 1, and plus 1 of 1 over n. So it's 1 minus a half, plus a third, minus a quarter, and so on. And we note, if I throw away the minus signs, this thing's definitely going to diverge. So do we have the two conditions to get convergence for the alternating series here? Well, what do you need? One, we need the limit goes to zero. Okay, that definitely holds. We've done this one plenty of times. And then I also need decreasing, and that we get for free because I just graph 1 over x, and that's a decreasing function as we go off to infinity. So the alternating series here is going to converge. So let's look at the picture for what just happened. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot our partial sums against the n-axis. Let's take a look at what's happening. So we'll do the first five partial sums, and let's see, we have first one is 1, second one is 1 minus a half is 0.5, we add a third, gives me 0.833, subtract a quarter, gives me 0.5833, and then we add 1 fifth, and that gives me 0.7833. So if I plot each of these, you notice what's happening here. Connect the dots, creates a sawtooth, but the main thing that's happening is, okay, we start at A1, Subtracting off A2 gets us to there. Then when I add A3, it comes back up, but not all the way. Subtract off a quarter, it comes down, but not all the way. Add a fifth, it goes back up, but not all the way. So the idea is each term is going to bring us a little bit closer to that limit that we're going to wind up at. Now, in this case, you're looking at roughly 0.693 for the sum of this series. Okay, but let's take a look at how slow this thing gets there. If I take 100 terms, okay, and I go to the computer to do this, light programming, but you don't want to do it with a calculator unless you've got a good calculator. Okay, 0.6881722. So with 100 terms, I'm not even nailing down the 100th spot. If I go to 10,000, I get 0 0.6930972. And if I go to a million, 0.6931469. Okay, probably a little bit later we'll talk about how you tell whether you're close to your sum or not, depending on what kind of accuracy you're interested in. Okay, why is 
Is this true? What is this picture going to give us? All right. So to start off to show this, I'm only going to consider what's happening with the bottom points. So if you notice, they're only going to occur when the index is 2, 4, 6, the evens. So what we can do is, I'm just going to define a new sequence. I'll call it B sub n, which is just given by taking the even entries for our partial sum sequence. So I'm only going to consider S2, S4, S6. That's going to be our new sequence. Now note, if I want to go from one partial sum to the next by adding 2 to the index, that's the same as adding a to n minus 1 minus a to n. All right, that's just write out what each partial sum is. So the partial sum for S to 2n is just a1, and then you alternate the signs to get to a 2n. Okay, remember that the a sub 2n is going to pick up the minus sign since we have an even number of terms here. Same thing for this. And then notice, what are we missing when we write down the partial sum for this guy? Well, we just need a sub 2n minus 1, which has a plus, and then minus a sub 2n. Okay, notice if we're doing that correctly, these are minus signs that alternate. So I'm going to use this equation here to get some mileage. Let's note something. Our sequence is decreasing, so that's going to mean that a sub 2n minus 1 is bigger than a sub 2n. So that's going to mean if I take their difference, I get a positive number. So note what's happening. For my partial sums, going with just the even indices, I go from one term to the next by adding on a positive number. Okay, that's going to mean the sequence for b sub n is going to be increasing. If I'm only considering the even indices, it's going to give me an increasing sequence. We're also going to have that my b sub n is a bounded sequence. Okay, we're going to show that it's between 0 and a1 for all n. All right, let's rewrite our s sub 2n just in terms of pairs. Because our a sequence is decreasing, if I take the difference between any two consecutive ones, I'm going to get a positive number. So s sub 2n is just a sum of positive numbers, and that's definitely going to make it bigger than 0. Also, we can take the pairs one step over. So I'll leave a1 by itself, but then I'm going to take a2 minus a3. Notice that s sub 2n, we just write things out. I'm going to start with a positive number. Then a2 minus a3 is a positive number, but we're going to subtract. And then as I go through with the pairs, we'll be left with a minus a of the 2n. Upshot is, okay, remember a sub 2n is also positive. I'm taking a number. Okay, and I'm going to keep subtracting off positive numbers. So that means I have to be less than the original number, so I have to be less than or equal to my a1. Okay, can be strictly less than. Doesn't hurt to put that in there for what we want to do. Since our sequence is bounded and monotone increasing, I can appeal to the monotone convergence theorem to see that our sequence converges to some limit s. All right. So the evens are going to converge. A similar argument is going to show that the odds are going to converge to some s prime. And that's going to be because we'll have bounded and instead monotone decreasing. So if we're looking at the picture here, the evens are on the bottom, monotone increasing up to s. The odds are on the top, monotone decreasing down to s. OK. Want to show that s equals s prime? Well, we get that by noting that s sub 2n equals s sub 2n minus 1 minus a sub 2n. For that, you just write out what each partial sum looks like. That's just going to be a1 minus a2 plus a3. And then you'll see that the difference between these two is just in this last term. We take the limit, both sides. Limit of s sub 2n is going to give me s. Limit of s sub odds is going to give me s prime. And then the limit of a sub 2n is just going to be 0. The limit of a sub n is 0 by assumption. Limit of a sub 2n, well, that's just only considering every other entry in the sequence for a sub n. So that's still going to go to the same limit. So that has to go to 0. Let's take a look at what the picture is doing in terms of our interval picture for a limit. Now, note, for the evens, we're going to be increasing up to our limit s. 
So these are all going to go up. So once I fix an n, all the other s sub 2 n's are going to live above it and below s. So they're trapped in this interval. For the odds, once you fix your n, you're going to have yourself decreasing down to s. So all of our s sub odds for bigger 2n minus 1 are to keep moving in this direction, but they'll never get past s, so they're all going to be trapped in this top piece of the interval. Upshot is, if you give me an n, we can get an interval where all the s sub n's are trapped past a given point. So how does the limit definition work? You give me an epsilon, I slap epsilon on each side of my limit s. Then what I have to do is I have to return to you a number m such that whenever we use the index of a number that's past m, the s sub n's have to live in the interval that you just gave me to test. The way I'm going to get inside that interval is, well, note the length of the interval here from s sub 2n minus 1 to s sub 2n it's going to have length a sub 2n because s sub 2n is equal to s sub 2n minus 1 minus a sub 2n. The limit of a sub n goes to 0, so I can make this length here as small as I want. So I'll make it small enough so that I get inside of your epsilon. Once we've done that, I know by the argument I just gave that all the s sub n's past the one I've fixed are going to live inside of this interval. So I've trapped all the future s sub n's inside there. That's our definition of a limit. You have to be able to trap all of your large indices inside the interval. Okay, so that's going to mean the limit of the s sub n's as n goes to infinity are going to be equal to s. That's my definition for convergence of the series. So my alternating series is going to converge with limit s, which in practice we don't know. But for the purposes of this, it's just enough to know that it exists.